Let's go back to the origins of modern Judaism. So prior to the Age of Enlightenment, which can be broadly thought of as sandwich between the end of the late Middle Ages and the Age of Reason, the Age of Enlightenment, Jews were organized in what some described as rabbinical dictatorships, tight-knit communities where rabbis had absolute control over the lives of Jews. With the help of bribes, many European countries assisted rabbis in capturing, imprisoning, and executing Jews who didn't conform to Judaism. One of the bigotries and anti-Semitism embedded in late medieval Christianity was uh, forbidding Jews to hold property. And uh, as a result, a lot of Jews, of course, went into more intellectual professions, developed their human capital because they couldn't basically develop their real estate capital, which meant, of course, going into uh, doctors, lawyers, financiers, bankers, and so on. Um, and then, of course, they got involved in, in funding all of the destructive habits of the Western European uh, arist aristocracy and their endless pursuits of religious and secular warfare. For example, the famous Austro-Hungarian rabbi Moshe Sofer claimed, quote, Here in Bratislava, when I am told that a Jewish shopkeeper dared to open his shop during the lesser holidays, I immediately send a policeman to imprison him. Israeli scholar Israel Shahak stated, quote, This was the most important social fact of Jewish, Jewish existence before the advent of the modern state, observance of the religious laws of Judaism, as well as their inculcation through education, were enforced on Jews by physical coercion, from which one could only escape by conversion to the religion of the majority, amounting, in the circumstance, to a total social break, and for that reason very impracticable, except during a religious crisis. So it basically was a, a very violent cult that was uh, that used the power of non-Jewish secular authorities to imprison and, and kill uh, non-compliant Jews. So a pretty terrifying situation to be in. Shahak also writes, It is important to note that all the supposedly Jewish characteristics, by which I mean the traits such as humor, love of learning, and entrepreneurship, which vulgar so-called intellectuals in the West attribute to the Jews, are modern characteristics quite unknown during most of Jewish history and appeared only when the totalitarian Jewish community began to lose its power. He goes on to say, The Jewish religion governed the details of daily behavior in all aspects of life, both social and private, amongst the Jews themselves, as well as in their relation to non-Jews. It was then literally true that a Jew could not even drink a glass of water in the home of a non-Jew. Remember, of course, the Jews view themselves as the chosen people, the chosen race of God. And their view, uh, at least the, the textual view, of non-Jews is not, um, I guess you could say, rabidly flattering, which we'll get to in a bit. The Lurianic Kabbalah was uh, a school of Jewish mysticism that dominated Judaism and Madonna from the late 16th to the early 19th century. And one of its basic tenets is the absolute superiority of the Jewish soul and body over the non-Jewish soul and body. All right, so the Enlightenment movement, which was really, um, it had a lot to do with a lot of complicated things, which I've gone into in other shows, but it spread the concepts of, of rationality, reason, empiricism, and individualism, as well as the Baconianly developed scientific method throughout Europe. And it challenged a lot of religious traditions in the process. It spread uh, uh, deism, which was the belief that there, may have, there was a divine creator, but he basically started the motor and then let the lawnmower run itself and took off somewhere else. And uh, it spread uh, agnosticism and outright atheism and was a great challenge to the mystical power of the religious authorities. This, of course, included Judaism. The rabbi stranglehold still prevented Jews from exploring these new ideas. But very, very briefly, uh, one of the things that happened was in the 11th and 12th centuries, they came up with some really impressive improvements in farming methods. They discovered how to plant and nurture winter crops, which meant you didn't basically have to half starve to death during the winter. So they grew turnips and stuff in the winter. They also found, a, a, a invented a shoulder harness for the horses and cattle. Before there was a harness that the more weight they pulled, the, the, the choked. So the shoulder harness allowed them to pull, uh, to, to pull more plows and so on to, to um, uh, dig the cro crops deeper, keep them safer from birds. So in some places in Europe, you saw a five to 10 to 15 fold times increase in crop production 
and this meant fewer people were needed on the farms, and it also pr produced and provided the excess food that is necessary for the development of cities. When you start developing cities, you lay down the potential for uh, agri for uh, industrialization because you have an excess labor force, some of whom are there voluntarily because they are not needed on the farm, and some of, their, um, some of them are there involuntarily because their lands would be basically stolen by arist aristocrats during the enclosure movement. Now, when you start to have the growth of the cities, you start to get the growth of the intellectuals, you revive book culture, and there's a, there was a refocus and re-emphasizing on the Greco-Roman texts of law and philosophy that had been lost to the West and held by the Muslims for many centuries. And one of the uh, important ideas was equality before the law, and this idea began to take hold in many European countries. And at the same time, after... Um, uh, Luther nailed his uh, theses to the church door in Wittenberg. Uh, there was uh, hundreds of years of religious warfare as the various sects of Christianity, uh, of course, there was the main Catholic uh, gr group, and then there was the divided up uh, Protestant groups, those of Engalians, the, the, the Calvinists, the uh, Anabaptists, the, the Lutherans, and so on. And they all tried to gain control of the state in order to impose their will on others. And uh, this is where the separation of church and state basically came from, is after hundreds of years of a general religious slaughterhouse and pretty much uh, seppuku by, by religion uh, on the part of the Western uh, states, uh, they began to think of maybe we should have a separation of church and state. And the same thing will happen eventually once we suffer enough for the separation of state and economics, but that's perhaps a topic for another time. So once the Greco-Roman ideas of equality before the law began to take hold and the separation of church and state began to take hold, the states began to refuse to collaborate with the rabbis. But um, religious, not only did they refuse to collaborate with the rabbis and uh, imprison or kill non-compliant Jews, but religious persecutions were now discouraged and sometimes actively prohibited. And this, of course, is very bad for the priestly class, right? The priestly class, the rabbi class, uh, they, um, they develop their skills in conjunction with secular powers to have intellectual and moral and mystical domination over a particular tribe, and they don't give up, of course, without a fight, as we'll see. Even the notorious Nicholas I of Russia, who was known for persecuting Jews, began to actively undermine the rabbinical dictatorships. In the late 1830s, for example, the holy rabbi of a small Jewish town in Ukraine was severely punished for ordering the murder of a heretic. The rabbi and his men threw the victim in the boiling water of the local baths, expecting to get away with it, as they normally would, but the legal authorities of Russia refused to turn the other way. Uh, in other words, rather than killing people for non-compliance or having them in prison for non-compliance, which in the later Middle Ages and Enlightenment was pretty much a death sentence, uh, you actually had to try and convince people of the quality of your ideas through debate and argument rather than through indoctrination and intimidation. And uh, it doesn't work so well for people who are not rational, let's say. So as the rabbis began to lose the power, because they couldn't basically order hits on non-compliant members, as the rabbis began to lose their power, fears of assimilation and cultural breakdown began to spread in Jewish communities. Without force, without violence, without the sword of the state, what was to stop Jews from rejecting Judaism and exploring Enlightenment ideas? So once they began to be free of the threat of coercion, some Jews decided to challenge the tenets of Orthodox Judaism. They started to learn modern languages and pursued secular education. The movement of Jewish emancipation brought about a split in the traditionally terrified and cohesive Jewish settlements. Many Jews from Western Europe embraced the idea of cultural and social integration, while Eastern European Jewish communities largely retained their religious structure. Uh, Russia, broadly speaking, Russia and Germany did not go through the Enlightenment for a variety of reasons. In Russia, the power of the, the ruling class was so strong, and in Germany, there was just a nonstop religious warfare. They didn't really go through the Enlightenment, and this is one of the reasons why they ended up as the two great dictatorships of the 20th century, uh, National Socialism and Communism. So there were two, two primary trends among the more secular Jews of the West. Many of the descendants of rabbis, such as Karl Marx, Moses Hess, and Rosa Luxemburg, developed the theoretical foundations of communism and socialism, while Jews coming from poor and underprivileged backgrounds were typically more attracted to accumulating wealth in the growing uh, free market. So you can sort of think of the, the, one of the great uh, Jewish descendant oppositions is Karl Marx versus uh, Ayn Rand, and uh, Ayn Rand was the daughter, of course, of a bourgeoisie who had his uh, livelihood and, and uh, income stolen by communists, 
And uh, Karl Marx was the descendant of uh, a rabbi who converted to Christianity for survival reasons. And um, this uh, blowback is important. I'll talk about this at the end of the presentation. But when you start taking away the power of the exquisitely well-tuned verbal abusers known as the priestly class, uh, they can morph right? and, and they can change to still have dominance in other language-based cloud castles of imprisonment. So you can easily, fairly easily switch from religiosity to uh, communism, which is one of the reasons why communism opposed religiosity so strongly, because it was a direct competitor. It's like one mafia group opposing another mafia group. And this is one of the things that happens. You always forget, everyone forgets about the blayback. It's like, blayback.